Carlson tonight, an angry mob gathered in downtown Tehran yesterday, chanting slogans attacking the United States. Protesters stole an American flag from a nearby vehicle and set it on fire. America was never great, they screamed. Terrifying. But hold on a sec. That actually didn't happen in Iran, much as it seems like it. It happened in Los Angeles, in our country, the one they say was never great. The screaming, stealing, flag-burning mob was there to express their love and support for Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Waters had inspired them with rhetoric like this. Do you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station? You get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome anymore, anywhere. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Los Angeles, a newly opened coffee shop was attacked by masked protesters who hurled feces at the building. They said the owner of the building supports Donald Trump's immigration policies. Well, as it happens, the owner is himself an immigrant. I'm confused, he said, but it didn't matter. On the left, the penalty for thought crime is swift and certain, if nonsensical. For disagreeing with the mob on immigration, the immigrant owner is not allowed to make a living. Those are the rules. Well, this lunacy did not come out of the blue. It has been brewing for quite some time. Well, we first saw this brand of extremism on college campuses where student activists demonstrated against new ideas they didn't understand or against any kind of dissent from the narrow orthodoxy of the campus left. Over time, though, their protests became physical and then dangerous. Windows smashed, fires set, people beaten and threatened with death. In the past few months, scenes like that have moved off campus into our world. The left began threatening Trump administration officials who dared to appear in public kicking them out of restaurants and screaming at them on the street. Now they're targeting private citizens who might be sympathetic to the administration. Want to open a small business? Well, you can't do that unless you voice this week's progressive dogmas. That's a lesson corporate America learned years ago and has applied ever since. It is, of course, the very opposite of freedom. The fall elections are less than four months from today. Tempers will rise even higher than they are now. That is guaranteed. Something awful could easily happen. Now, right now, is the time for progressive leaders to douse the fires that they set to calm their inflamed supporters. It is vital they do that. And yet they're doing the opposite. Now they're telling their followers that the president of the United States is a traitor. The penalty for treason is death. Traitors, of course, must be overthrown. The mob screams, wild with rage. Democrats are banking that that rage will get their voters to the polls in November. And they may be right. It may. It may also destroy the country. Robert Patia was a radio host and an attorney, and he joins us tonight. Robert, thank you for coming on. I have a question Thanks, that Parker. I wanted to ask for a long time, someone on the left. Why the flag burning and the attacks on America? Why, is this, the, well, these protests very often devolve into an attack on the country itself. It's symbols, this chant, America was never great, your founding fathers owned slaves. Why attack the whole country? Well, I think you can find extremists on both the left and the right who do things that are anti-American. The, the same way you have these protesters, you'll have the Charlottesville protesters on the other hand who are anti-American. I don't support any of these people who, if you don't like America, get out of America. If you're a neo-Nazi, get out of America. Well, I, kinda, I, I agree every 15 with that. Minutes. Well, look, I'm, so I have no problem with that. But, there's, but, but hold on. Okay. And I think it's a fair point. But the scale is very different. So you have the Charlottesville riot or whatever it was last August, a year ago. You haven't seen anything like that since. The NFL has been in a continuous controversy over kneeling during the national anthem, an attack on a national symbol. Left-wing protests routinely contain attacks on the country. The t-shirt, your country was never great, is for sale online. So is the hat. What is that about? It, I'm not saying there are no conservatives, right wingers who don't hate America, but there are a lot on the left who do. And they're very open about it. Why? And why don't leaders ever say anything about it? 
Well, I think leaders do, and I think it's very easy to find the clips of the most crazy, most extreme elements of the political discourse and make that seem like that is the norm. That is not the norm. Most people are, who are protesting are saying, we want reasonable policies that all Americans unite, can unite around. And frankly, I think a large part of this falls on the president. You know, President Truman had a placard on his desk saying, the buck stops here. That's what the, that is what President Trump has right. to take up and understand, that he has to bring these parties together. If people are protesting over the immigration policy, then do like Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan would do, and you bring together the stakeholders, you, you hammer out an immigration reform bill, you bring right. it before the American people, you discuss it, and that will tamp down the uh, that will tamp down these protests. But leaving this vacuum Boy, of information is... where people think the children are being kidnapped, that's not going to work. Okay, so I agree with a lot of what you're saying, actually. I do want a rational conversation about what's best for the country. Try to do that every night on this show. It's pretty hard to do that, though, when people are saying not just and Senate are calling the president of the United States a traitor, someone who's committed treason, a death penalty offense. If you really believe the president was a Russian agent, as elected members of Congress have said today, then how could you do anything but try to overthrow him? That's not a predicate for reasonable discussion, is it? Well, absolutely not. But what, what, what I think has to happen is the president hasn't explained what the point of the meeting with Putin was, what happened in that meeting with him for those two hours, why there was no other members of the intelligence community or national security staff there with him, why he offered to have Russians interrogate American citizens. So when you have this information vacuum, this falls in a large part on the president's communications well, wait, team wait, wait, wait for a second. not then, articulating then, then to why Americans are they, what hold went on. on. Hold on. I mean, I could look, I could rebut a lot of what you just said. The president can't hand anybody over to the Russians, despite what Democrats keep saying. That, that doesn't work that way. You're not allowed. What is he going to, you know, inject them with barbiturates and throw them on a plane to my, I mean, that's it's ludicrous. But I, it's not my job to defend Trump. I'm just asking if you don't know what happened, why are you jumping to the conclusion that he committed treason? That's what elected members of Congress are saying. They're using the word treason. If you really believed he was committing treason, why wouldn't you try to overthrow him or hurt him? Seriously. But remember, but remember, this goes back to the concept of the buck stopping with the president. He has to use his bully pulpit not to bully people, but to articulate a message to America. What do you mean? I but hold on, but what do you Ameri say if somebody well, says, you wait, if I said, if I said, I don't agree with you, you're, you've committed treason, you're a traitor, you're a sleeper cell for one of our enemies. What do you say to that? I mean, honestly, what like that's... What you, that's not well, what you say the that, beginning of a conversation that is being that's a call for violence. Look, Tucker, I practice criminal right. defense every day. And what ends up happening is people accuse your client of everything under the sun in the indictment. But what you do is argue back your point. You say that, well, the reason I was meeting with Putin was because we have interest in Syria that need to be articulated between the two parties because well, we have to said that. Uh, work on I mean, oil and gas pipelines. The, he's not getting his messaging out. And when you leave this vacuum out there, that's when you have members of the Republican Party. Are you being from serious? Jeff I mean, are Lake you being serious? Down. Look, I, again, it's. Uh, whatever. I don't care about the Republicans. Everyone always says, oh, the Republicans say it, too. I, I couldn't be less impressed with them as a group. So it, that means nothing to me. <laughs> but will you at least concede that calling someone a traitor is a conversation ender, not a starter? And maybe you should wait for any... evidence that a person has betrayed his country before calling him a traitor. Is that fair? Well, well, that, that's fair, but let's not pretend that the last eight years, the last 16 years didn't happen. When you have people claiming that Obama was a Kenyan who was part of a sleeper cell sent here and part of a madrasa. Let's understand this discourse didn't start with Trump. No we have to do something to tap it down. That. Joe Walsh no, yelled out, no you lie. No member of Congress ever said that. Okay, well, he and, did and, lie, and actually, President, but lying and, is very different from being part Trump, of a sleeper cell. And while being a private citizen, right. President Trump pushed a birtherism idea for years. Let's understand that the buck stops with the president in order to tap these things down. Have a conversation with so the American people. He's Say exactly what you're. The All buck right. stops with you. You are the leader of the free yeah. world. I, I don't understand your point, but I. I uh, right. I appreciate. I appreciate part of what you're trying to say, uh, but I don't understand the rest. Robert, it's nice to see you tonight. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, Tucker. A professor at. Yale University, which is like an Ivy League school that people once upon a time considered impressive, but smart people no longer do, is now calling on fellow progressives to actively defy federal law by hiding illegal immigrants. His name is Greg Gonsalves. He's supposedly a law professor, and yet he tweeted this recently, quote, 
We hide immigrants from ICE if we have to. The professor says this would be, quote, civil disobedience rather than aiding and abetting criminal activity. Lawrence Jones is editor-in-chief of Campus Reform. He's been following this and joins us tonight. Um, this leads to the larger hey, question, Tucker. Lawrence, of why we even bother to fund universities. They're a joke, but we're getting to that later yeah. in the show. To the specifics of this case, how did he yeah. express this? What was the response? Well, I asked a simple question. I am an editor-in-chief. I'm a journalist. This is something that the left said uh, is being attacked. So I asked the question, are you guys aiding and abetting? Simple question. He in return blocked me and decided to uh, go after my organization and say that we should be on the list for the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center. That simple. <laughs> the Southern Poverty Law. That's the fake civil rights group that yeah. uh, gets yeah. people banned, that crushes the free speech rights of people it disagrees with. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with them. Um, so he didn't respond at all. Do you find in a meaningful way, do you find it ironic that a law professor would be calling yeah. on his students to ignore the law? Well, we couldn't find his actual law degree. So, I mean, I don't even understand how he's teaching students about the law. Um, you know, you know, it's crazy, Tucker, Wait, because I'm, I'm sorry. What do you, know, you, what do you a, mean? What do you I'm sorry. I'm interrupting you. What, what do you mean by that? You couldn't find his law degree. Well, we couldn't find his law degree. We couldn't find a JD behind his name, but he's he's teaching at the school. So, I, I, you know, he must have a PhD, but it, it's not specifically. He's not a lawyer. He's not a practicing lawyer. We couldn't find it. So unless he has huh. records that are being hidden, we would love to, love to see that. But, Tucker, my point is there's a lot of laws that I don't like. I'm a civil libertarian, and I, I, I want to push the war on drugs yeah, that agree. went after my community. I didn't, I didn't like those communities. But I don't get to say right. DEA. I get to harbor in a bent criminal. That just don't, doesn't work that way. And so the, the, instead of him answering my question, uh, he went after the president of our company because he's an old white man. And he didn't want to face the black man, the black reporter that asked him the question, are you aiding and abetting? Just a simple question. But let's ta attack the old white guy. <laughs> That's kryptonite for a guilty white liberal. <laughs> That's hilarious. Right. Lawrence, thank you very much. Good to see you. <laughs> so Thanks, good. Tucker. Dan Bongino is a former Secret Service agent, NYPD officer, now an NRA TV contributor, frequent guest on this show because he's smart and concise and thinks stuff through. So, um, Dan, we've done a bunch of shows on this topic, but we're going to continue to because I think I'm not imagining the acceleration of the rhetoric. And when rhetoric reaches a certain point, it becomes violence. Where are we on that continuum, do you think? Yeah, I'm worried. We're, uh, we're, we're past the event horizon right now in the black hole, Tucker. And the reason I'm worried is uh, I think what's going on here, um, and, and I'm not trying to be an amateur sociologist here, but in the past we've had kind of this iron triangle of activist groups, liberal politicians, and the media. And their tactic, Tucker, has been very strictly enforced gaslighting. Repeat a narrative, however false it is. Republicans are racist, misogynists. We've heard them all in the past. Repeat it confidently and isolate people from the truth by collectively reporting the narrative together. I think what's happening right now is Trump just absolutely refuses to back down to this. He'll use his Twitter account. He'll use the bully pulpit of the White House. And he will not play the typical rhino game of the past where the minute the R word or the M word or the xenophobic word comes out, he backs down. Therefore, to wrap this up, he... Um, Average levels of aggression aren't working, Tucker. So instead of dialing it back and re-strategizing, they're going to like hyper aggression at this point, And that's where we are now, which really worries me. But it's the supposedly responsible people who are doing it. Twice or three times this week, I thought, now, if this were Obama who went to Helsinki and met with Putin, and I'd never liked Obama. I thought he was bad for America. And all of a sudden, Republican leaders were calling him a traitor. Would I sit back and say, yeah, he's a traitor? Or would I say, what do you mean by that? I mean, where are the responsible people on the left? It's OK to, hate, to not like Trump. I get it. But why are they sitting back and allowing the leaders of their party to say things that are totally reckless and insane, which they are? 
because Tucker, they've ginned up the base to such a point. You saw it in the opening segment with your debate with the liberal radio host. They've ginned up the base into believing that this man is actually these things. These are false. They're utterly absurd. The fact that we're repeating them, we've lost 10 IQ points talking about it. But they've ginned up their base into believing exactly. that this man is, the Trump, by the way, is a fascist. What else is the appropriate response? It's nothing but critical theory, you know, that acknowledges a construct of power kind of thing. And this, we have to shut him down. It's not even worthy of debate. And the hyper aggressive response is the only response if you believe Trump is a fascist, which is absolutely absurd and ridiculous. This Russia story is making us all very dumb. I'm not going to be able to balance my checkbook by next week. It's Dan Bongino, thank you very much. Good to see you. Yes, sir. You too. Well, last night we broke the story that two sources say that Tony Podesta has been offered immunity from criminal prosecution in return for testimony against Paul Manafort. We have new developments in that story tonight, and that's after the break. ...that we spoke to directly told us that the lobbyist Tony Podesta, of course a huge fundraiser for Bill and Hillary Clinton, the brother of Hillary's campaign chairman, had been offered a criminal immunity by Robert Mueller in return for testifying against Paul Manafort, with whom he worked to lobby on behalf of Ukraine once upon a time. Well, we asked the obvious question when we heard this, what distinguishes Tony Podesta from Paul Manafort, who, by the way, is behind bars facing life now in solitary confinement? Well, maybe the answer is only one of them supported Donald Trump. We're happy to root out all the unregistered foreign agents in this country, but the law should apply to everybody, not just people who support a president Washington despises. Joe DeGeneva has been in Washington a long time. He's a former U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, and he joins us tonight. Um, so, Joe, it, as we said last night, I want to restate now, we spoke to two separate sources who told us, who were close to this question, that Tony Podesta, former head of the Podesta Group, the biggest Democratic lobbying firm in Washington, had been offered immunity by the Mueller investigation in exchange for testifying against Paul Manafort. If that is true, what does it mean? It means that the Mueller investigation has now reached a level of debasement akin to the ninth level of hell in Dante's Inferno. It also means that if you're a Democrat, you get a pass. There are two standards of justice in this yeah. town being carried out by the Department of Justice under both administrations and the FBI under both administrations. The FBI and the DOJ under Obama gave Hillary Clinton a pass. They ignored criminal violations and found her innocent when, in fact, she had violated the law. They immunized her lawyers. They immunized her staff. They immunized the people who bleached her computer. All of them were Democrats. And now in the prosecution of Paul Manafort, who do they immunize first? The person who broke the law, just like allegedly Paul Manafort did, helped the Russians, helped some phony Ukrainians. And what does Bob Mueller do first? He immunizes a guilty Democrat. So give us some perspective on the FARA law, Foreign Agent Registration Act of 1938. It's been around a long time. Yes. In 50 years between 1966 and 2016, seven people were prosecuted under it. Seven yes. in 50 years. <laughs> in the past year, we've had three people prosecuted yes. under it, all of them connected to Donald Trump. Does this seem like selective enforcement of the law to you? Well, there's no doubt that it does. And even though it technically is within the power of a prosecutor to make these types of decisions, what you are seeing rolled out now by Robert Mueller, the esteemed Mr. Mueller, is the degradation of the federal criminal law enforcement process. And you can thank Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, who set up this phony investigation, and Christopher Wray, the current FBI director, who has never once put on his big boy pants and is allowing this to happen. This is an embarrassment to federal law enforcement. Every FBI agent, every DOJ lawyer who's worth his or her salt knows that what you are watching is a debasement of federal law enforcement. It ought to be an embarrassment to somebody like Mueller, but the truth is Mueller has stayed too long at the fair. Joe DeGeneva, former federal prosecutor, thank you very much. Michael Caputo was an advisor to the Trump campaign. He has been around the block in this Russian nonsense, and he joins us tonight. Uh, Michael, what is your response to the news, again, from two sources telling us Tony Podesta has been offered immunity in order to testify against Paul Manafort? What would that mean from your point of view, if true? Oh, it's completely disgusting, Tucker. I, I can't think of another word for it. 
Uh, this is very clearly partisan. Uh, Tony Podesta didn't just represent uh, the Ukrainians and didn't register for them. He actually registered for Uranium One and Rosatom. Uh, he represented Sparebank, which is, a, you know, that's like representing directly Vladimir Putin. Sparebank is his hip, uh, Vladimir Putin's hip pocket bank. From my perspective, uh, they're, they're probably giving him immunity, not just because he can do something to hurt Paul Manafort, because they certainly don't want him talking about Uranium One and Sparebank. If there was somebody in Washington representing the Russians in 2016, it was Tony Podesta. And by the way, Tucker, there are 17 Democrats who registered for Russian companies that were connected to the Kremlin or actually registered to represent the Kremlin. And those are just the ones who were registered. As you know, the Washington is lousy right. with people doing the bidding of foreign countries without registering. Yeah, I mean, it's they're literally everywhere. They're on my street. They're mm -hmm. on everybody's street in the entire city, which is why to see the Farrah law applied in the way it has been in the last year is just bewildering. And by the way, I'm not against it. I don't think people should lobby for foreign governments without registering. But to see it applied only to one side is is genuinely, genuinely shocking. Um, well, very I think quickly, you hit it on the, news on the today. head. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. A fair only ma uh, matters if you know Donald Trump. I mean, certainly lobbying for foreign countries is completely legal in the United States. But if you do it uh, and you work for Donald Trump or you knew Donald Trump, uh, you're, you're, you're headed for problems. As far as I can tell, the biggest and most effective foreign lobbyists in Washington are not registered under FARA. So maybe that will change. Hope so. Michael, great to see you. Great to see you, Tucker. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks. Well, in cities across America, the more liberal, the more likely this is to be. Illegal immigrants are getting voting rights. Why is that not a threat to American democracy? If Russians influencing our elections is bad, why is foreigners from Latin America influencing our elections not bad? We'll ask that question. As recently as a few years ago, there were progressives who at least paid lip service to the idea of securing the border. Now that idea is dead, its grave has been bulldozed again and again. On the left, the new policy is to abolish ICE border enforcement, make every city a sanctuary city, then give illegal immigrants welfare benefits and the right to vote. But don't worry, they're telling us, importing millions of new non-citizen voters isn't interfering in our elections. That's only what incompetent Russians do on Facebook. It's something better than that. It's the next frontier in civil rights. Ethan Behrman is a California radio show host, and he joins us tonight. So, Ethan, this is a question I've been asking to a number of my progressive friends in the last 48 hours. Why is it wrong for non-citizens from Russia to play a role in our electoral process, but okay for non-citizens from other countries to play a role in our electoral process? Both seem wrong to me. To Totally separate issues. Uh, the Russians are actually attacking us, undermining not only the election systems themselves, but the integrity of our federal elections. What we're talking about in cities like San Francisco is allowing um, immigrants who are here, who have children enrolled in schools, who are paying taxes to vote for the local school board where we need them to be Whoa. participating and being active wait, but, for but wait, wait, positive wait, outcomes. Wait, wait a second. I mean, hold on. No, no, you don't know that. I mean, the Russians who hacked our election Yes. Living here, some of them. I mean, you could have Russian agents living in the United States and they have a vested interest in the government of the United States. And they're trying to affect the outcome of an election that determines who leads the United States. So by the standards that you just set out, that's cool. But somehow it's not cool because they're Russian or they don't vote Democrat. I mean, why? What is the difference? Honestly, I'm confused. Yeah, the difference is pretty clear and significant. GRU intelligence officers operating out of a, a, a data center in Moscow, for example, or an office in Moscow, who are actively attacking the databases of our local and state elections, who are actually attempting to interfere with, for example, our command and control systems for our critical infrastructure, a la black energy malware. Um, that is ultimately and fundamentally different than somebody who came no, here for a job no, that was brought here by an employer who have kids uh -huh. in school as required oh, because by law. Their kids they're, have to be in school. They're cool people. First of all, they weren't brought here by employers. That's that's not true, as you know. But oh, wait, hold on. Sure. Well, I, I'm still confused. Enticed. So the government of Mexico encourages 
people to come to the United States illegally and vote. They do. They say it out loud. That's okay with you because why? It's a foreign government that has different interests from those of the United States. It's hostile to the U.S. often, and they're seeking to influence our elections. But you're okay with that because why? No, because on federal elections, that's against federal law to vote if you're not a citizen. No, but so what's happening I've in never heard like a Boston single liberal is, complain about it. Oh, well, I, I, I only want citizens to vote in federal elections per federal law. So in, st in local issues, we have horrible participation by, by uh, Americans, and this is evidence in a Portland State University study. So for like city councils and mayors, horrible turnout, and it's basically old, we wealthy white people who show up to vote. So that's plantation style politics that we're trying to encourage. Oh, it's white Instead people. of saying, let's get okay, more people. So Older, it, it, no, you know, it really wouldn't be a conversation talker. with a liberal fact, unless they Portland had some State casual University. racism in there attacking a group that of is a fact. people on the basis it's of their skin the color. Data show totally that. cool. Not, we had a whole not, civil rights that, movement that, against it, but we're for it now. Right. I get that. Okay. No, that, I totally get it. But that's what the data okay. show, Tucker. But let me just, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the data show that the left is casually racist in almost every conversation you have with them, and no one seems to notice except me. It's so weird, but whatever. Let's just re very quickly get back to the topic, which is the line between legitimate voting and illegitimate voting. Mm -hmm. A lot of us believed that citizenship conferred the right to choose your government. That's what democracy is. The left is now saying that's not true. People who are foreign national citizens of other countries get to control our government. OK, but only when the outcome helps Democrats. That is literally the position of the Democratic Party. And I'm just saying that's totally indefensible on logical grounds. Not that logic matters in 2018, but I just want you to acknowledge that I'm right. No, because federal law prohibits non-citizens from voting in a federal election. You can't vote for president or a congressperson or a senator if you're not a citizen. So would you be cool with Russians cities. hacking the school board? Would you be cool with Russians voting in a school board election? If they are here and they have children enrolled in that school district, yes, of course. That's I not a requirement. To be involved. That's not a requirement that, that, for the election, as you know. Yeah. That, okay. That, but we know the data again show that kids have a much better outcome in educational settings when the parents are involved, and if we can get better parent involvement right. in yeah. local American schools, citizens, the kids do right. better. Okay. Well, wh whether well, whether you end you. up r rounding Great. them up and shipping them back from where they came from, we want them to have better outcomes. And that is the goal. Ethan Behrman, great to see you. Thanks, Tucker. Well, one college professor wants America to shut down colleges. He says our universities are not worth saving because they are that corrupt. He joins us next to explain what he's learned over decades working there. Jason Hill is a professor of philosophy at DePaul University, but if we follow his advice, he could soon be unemployed. He just published a remarkable piece in the Hill newspaper saying that universities, and he's worked in them for a long time, have become so overwhelmed by identity politics, socialism, anti-Americanism, and dumbness that essentially they're beyond saving. He suggests that taxpayers and private donors pull funding and let the whole system collapse for the betterment of the country. Professor Hill is also the author of the book, We Have Overcome, which I have not read but plan to because his piece is literally that good and you should read it. He joins us now. Professor, thank you uh, for coming on tonight. So did thank I so misread much. what you wrote? You basically seem to have concluded after years of working right in the middle of it that the system is beyond saving. I think so. I think these Bolshevik loving welfare scholars have basically hijacked the system and are indoctrinating our students with not just anti-American invectives, but against the very core values that form our republic. Capitalism, free speech, the morality of wealth creation. And I think that we're seeing a correlation also between the anti-free free speech movements uh, that have been accelerating across campuses and the um, ideologies that are taking root in the classrooms, the, and the cultural relativism, the revolt against the Western canon, um, the cultivation of different perspectives, 
I think that we're not beyond repair. I think there's a solution. In my book, We Have Overcome, I go into some more detail of details about how we can address this dilemma in the academy. Well, within the confines of a cable news segment, sum it up for us. What do you think the solution is? I think the solution basically is for the federal government to stop funding universities that are spewing anti-American invectives, indoctrinating our students who exist in these curated silos and who are not used to other perspectives outside of their own and who are supposed to be getting a critical education. I think it's also time for alumni donors to start withdrawing their funds or if they're funding universities to start affixing conditions to their funding. You'd be surprised at the extent to which alumni donors just give millions and millions of dollars with no strings attached, yes. no conditions attached. Start saying, if I'm donating $10 million or $100,000, I need pro-American values taught. I need conservative values taught. I need values advocating not cultural Marxism and, uh, and, 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 and values that are inimical to Americanism, but we need values and, and, and scholarship, proper scholarship, that uh, are rejoinders right. to the, 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 the nonsense that's being taught on campus, campuses today. Professor, thank you for that. And again, I would encourage our viewers tonight to look you up, to look at what you've written and your book, because I really, I thought it was remarkable and brave. So Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the age of baby boys and baby girls appears to have come to a close. The most avant-garde parents are now raising babies. They don't have a gender. How does that work? Liberal Sherpa Kathy Aru, of course, knows the answer. She joins us next. Having a baby used to be a straightforward proposition. You could have a boy or you could have a girl. But now there's a third option. It's called steep civilizational decline. A handful of parents across America are deliberately keeping their children's sex hidden and instead raising so-called babies. The idea is that only the children themselves should be able to decide whether they are boys or girls without any of that pesky biological reality getting in the way. It's all very confusing like a lot of 2018 is. So of course we called in our interpreter of all things progressive, our liberal Sherpa, Kathy Aru, founding publisher of Catalina Magazine. She joins us tonight. So Kathy, goes without saying you're for this, of course, yep. but doesn't this mean if you're gonna raise a baby, how would you be able to change your child's diaper? Because the second you change the diaper, of course, you'd no longer be able to pretend that there was a question about whether this was a boy or a girl. You would know. <laughs> well, it's not about pretending. The parent definitely knows the gender. It's about not necessarily labeling the baby. It's about allowing the baby to decide what gender that baby wants to be when that baby can decide, which is around four years old. For, so from zero to four, the baby will not be labeled. The labeling theory will not apply from zero to four years old. The baby will be a baby, neither a boy nor a girl, uh, whatever gender that baby now what other chooses to what be. Other, what other profound life decisions do we think people ought to be making at the age of four? Are there any others? Well, you know, whether to get a tattoo, whether to get married, enlisting in the military, voting, drinking vodka, smoking Marlboro Reds. Is there anything else that we think four-year-olds are ready to decide? Uh, this isn't actually a profound life decision. I mean, biologically, yeah. there's nothing really going on from zero to four in that area that affects a person's life. Um, biologically, the experts say that boys and girls, uh, all genders are alike. The, the boy's brain, the male brain might be a little larger. The uh, female's language might be a little bit more advanced. Okay. No maybe, sexism on my show. Hold on. Whoa, sorry, slow down. No, sorry. Here you're out there like they say maybe boys' brains are, are larger. And yeah. I just want to say that kind of toxic masculinity has no place in this program. <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much. But that's all but they no, can look, think the, of. The bottom yeah. line is yeah. Yeah, all they could think of, like, difference in brain size, difference in genitalia, Perhaps. difference in bone structure. Perhaps. Just minor things minor. like Just minor, minor, minor. things like that. Yeah. No, yeah. not perhaps. Like, factually. So those are not minor things. Those are definitive things. Minor. So, like, why would you not tell your kids about that? You know, at some point, they're going to drop trow and look down and say, wait, 
We look different. You're going to be like, no, you don't. You're exactly the same. And that's, that's lying, isn't that's it? That's when the child, they say, is around four years old. So around zero to four, we're not going to say to a little um, female, uh, a girl, that uh, you're a little princess or boy, you're such a tiger. The labels are gone. You're not going to um, put that out outside influence on a child. You're just going to be neutral. Everything's going to okay. be neutral. The, the outside the influence equal. of biological reality. Not so would reality, you do this with anything perception. else? Would you, could, no, but, but could we decide that we're not going to acknowledge temperature or weather or traffic? And you could just say, you know what? I don't think it's raining outside. Or you can decide whether it's raining outside. I mean, the weatherman says it is, that there's snow on the ground. Or the weather, you, what? you know what I mean? The weatherman says that it's 15 degrees the, out. But I'm going to you know what I mean? Just kind of make up my own reality. The parents who are really no, leading this we acknowledge movement. biology and nature as real, right? But the biology, the parents who came out with this, who came out in the New York Times and started this baby awareness, um, this gender neutral awareness for babies, basically said, why should people be so obsessed if your baby is going to be a boy or a girl? Who cares about that area? It's actually a little human. We are bringing a little human into the world. Who cares about the genitalia? Because, Who cares? Uh, may, may I just suggest why? And this isn't just my opinion, but the opinion of every person who's ever lived going back, let's just say 10,000 years for the sake of neatness. Because men and women are completely different in key ways. Babies? Can we not say that anymore? Babies are different. Babies yeah. are different. They're little, they're yeah, little they are. human beings, and there's really not much of a difference between <laughs> different genders. No. <laughs> there is no difference. And men and women, right. we would All say, right. are equal. I'm trying to laugh they? so I don't cry. Ka Kathy Aru, you can be equal but different, which they are. Great to see you. Good to see Thank you. Thank you. Turns out, and this is not as important, obviously, as Vladimir Putin, but... UFOs are real, actually. The government believes they are. They're also far more common than we thought, and they may be a threat to commercial aviation. Hmm. One of the world's great experts on the... Well, for decades, only crackpots and crazy people believed in UFOs. That's what I thought anyway. And then in recent years, it turns out that governments have been taking them seriously all along. Very seriously. Nick Pope is a journalist who has spent years researching UFOs for the British government. He says that UFOs aren't just real. They also frequently come close to crashing into commercial airliners, among other things. Nick Pope joins us tonight. Nick, thank you very much for coming on. Um, so it's really not a question of do governments believe USOs, UFOs are real? Yes, they do. The United States government does. The British government does. The question is, do they have any idea what they are, where they're from? No, we don't. We keep an open mind on it. We don't rule anything uh, off, you know, take nothing off the table with this. Our point really is that whatever these things turn out to be, there is a serious defense, national security and air safety issue here. Yes. Well, so that's and, kind of the nub we, of it. And that is the, that, that's where my interest comes from. So why aren't governments encouraging the population to, as they say about terrorism, if you see something, say something, report sightings to the government so we can make sense of this potential threat. Well, they should be. And that's what we certainly did at the Ministry of Defense for many years. We took it very seriously. Our own pilots were seeing these things. We were having radar operators track them. And we knew, again, through intelligence and through open source material, we knew that the Russians and the Chinese and others were working on this too. The problem was that just the pop culture baggage from the term UFO, flying saucer, little green men, people right. don't take it seriously but they should. So we've ruled out, I think, that these are aircraft, experimental aircraft, or technically advanced aircraft from other countries. Is that true? Well, no, we keep an open mind, as I say, and, and some of these things probably are uh, Russian or Chinese, whoever it is, but th that's the point. We must find out if there's something in our airspace we need to know. Uh, for years, governments said they didn't do this. They did. 
I did it for the British government. I can only talk about this now because my old employers are gradually declassifying and releasing information about my old job. We now know, of course, the Pentagon had a program too. I think it will take congressional hearings to get to the bottom of all this, not just in, in uh, the United States, but all around the world. And I, I'd like to see those congressional hearings. Co uh, commercial pilots have very often reported sighting objects in the air that seem to defy the laws of physics. To what extent are these objects a threat to commercial aviation, potentially? Well, certainly the British Ministry of Defence and our Civil Aviation Authority, which is the UK equivalent of your FAA, have dozens of cases in our files about near misses, some of which where pilots have had to take evasive action. And again, it comes back to the point, I don't care in one sense what these things are, but when there is this flight safety concern, when we have these near misses, we right. sure as heck should be doing more to find out. That's for sure. Nick Pope, really one of the most credible experts on this subject. I hope you will come back on our show. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank that's you. That's it for us tonight and for the week. Tune in every night at 8, the show that's the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. See you Monday.